indeed hope that there is joy in the house of the Lord today, not least because we are talking about joy uh, this morning. If there was not joy in the house of the Lord, I was, um, I was, I was joking with Ileana that um, I, um, I believe in joy uh, so, so strongly. I believe that there must be joy so strongly that I'm angry about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> had to catch myself. I was like, I don't know if that would actually translate as I'm preaching an, ang- an angry sermon about joy. Um, so help me, you will be joyful. Uh, you know, one of those, one of those moments. Um, but let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer, uh, and um, then we will read our text for this morning's message. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you, by the Holy Spirit, as we abide in the eternal Son made incarnate in Jesus Christ, make us joyful. Whatever our circumstances, we have a great salvation. We have a Savior who satisfied the righteous demands of eternal justice for us. We have a Savior who tasted death and went into the grave For us, a place from which we we did not think we could return. And he was raised on the third day to live forever, uh, assuring us of eternal life and giving hope and assurance to all who will trust in him. That should give us joy. Uh, There are so many things perhaps in our situations and in our circumstances that, that we may be distracted by. Help us to never lose sight of the cross of Christ. Help us to never lose sight of the cross, that it is empty. Jesus is not hanging on it. And we go to the grave, help us to see that it is empty. And help us to look into the heavens and see that it is not empty. But it is full with an innumerable number of people gathered around the throne, singing, worthy, worthy is he who was slain. So we pray, Lord, that you would receive our joy today. And where joy is lacking, we pray that you would fill it up. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll be in uh, the book of Psalms, particularly in Psalm 16, beginning with verse 1. The word of the Lord reads, Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, You are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because He is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. Can we, can we read that last verse together? Verse 11. You make known to me the paths of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Uh, let, 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 let's read that one more time. I hope that that will really be ingrained in our minds. We can read it more joyfully, I hope. You, can make, you make known to me the paths of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. In John 15, Jesus describes himself as a vine and his people as branches. 
He commanded his disciples and by extension us today to abide in him. That is the command, abide in me. Not only did he command his disciples to abide in him, he promised them that if they abide in him, they will bear fruit. I keep reiterating that every week. The command is not in that text to bear fruit. The command is to abide in Jesus Christ. And as you abide in Jesus Christ, Jesus promises you will bear fruit. Later in writing to the churches of Galatia, uh, uh, put that in your, your minds, uh, it's a region in modern day Turkey, the provinces of Ankara and um, Eskishahir to be precise, uh, Paul tells us more about the fruit that Christ-abiding people bear. The fruit of the Spirit is. I will stop there. Remember, I'm just going to keep underlining this till everyone gets it. And never again does someone say the fruits of the Holy Spirit. It is fruit. It's not, it's, it's, it's not you know, a, a, an assortment. It's not a pick and mix and you can have some of this and you can have some of that. The fruit of the Spirit is. And then he gives a list. So picture it as, as I have previously a, as a pomegranate. You cut one fruit open and there's lots of seeds of goodness or a cluster of grapes. After all, we're abiding in a vine. So that seems very appropriate. Um, and each, each individual grape uh, signifies the one fruit, the grape fruit that we bear as we abide in the vine. Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. If you were to, to go back to the words of Jesus, and if you think I'm stretching things, remember the, the Scriptures are the Word of God and they are united, though written across 1,500 years by 43 different authors. They bear the same message. They are breathed out by the Holy Spirit. And so when we read in John chapter 15, you will bear fruit, the very first thing he begins to talk about fruit-wise is love. And do you know what the second thing he begins to talk about, Jesus begins to talk about, is joy. Indeed, uh, he says these things, verse 11 of John 15, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So, so Jesus had all of this in mind, right? It, it, not, not, there are no surprises with him anyway, but Jesus knows what sort of fruit comes from the person who abides in him. So if you are abiding in Jesus, you will bear love. And you will bear, as we are up to today, you will bear joy. Now, you're, you're probably saying, I don't feel joyful. What is joy anyway? Um, go to dictionary.com, look it up. Joy is defined as the emotion of great delight or happiness caused by something exceptionally good or satisfying. Keen pleasure, elation. Does anyone disagree with that? Just as it is. We'll go deeper. It is the emotion of great delight or happiness caused by something exceptionally good or satisfying. Keen pleasure, elation. Those are actually words or sentiments that are found in the psalm that we just read. I see no biblical or practical reason to disagree with the definition. Our emotions are made by God. Now, yeah, we, we, we can talk about the fall and we can talk about how our emotions get distorted and have been distorted and how as we sin against God, there's a lot of damage that gets done to our emotional self-expression. But your emotions were made by God. They were not only made by God, they were made for God. So, so your emotions 
are meant to be offered up to God as a pleasing sacrifice. Now, we sometimes stigmatize emotion or emotions in various ways because, we, you know, when, when we want to dismiss someone, sometimes you can say, oh, they're just being emotional. Or they're in their, their feelings. And, you know, that's often said in a way that makes it negative. And sometimes we're raised in that sort of context. Many people I've um, had the... Um, uh, privilege of helping and counseling over the years will tell me that they now as adults feel a sense of emotional detachment because of those little messages along the way. Or because perhaps the emotions that they experience were emotions of, uh, um, that, that we might say are very indicative more of a fallen humanity. Abusive use of emotions. And so that causes people to just unplug and to detach. God made the emotion that is joy. It's okay to be happy. I've read about cultures where if someone smiles, they're dismissed as a fool. If someone is, is glowing and smiling and they, they, they show their teeth, they're regarded as stupid. It's not, a, it's not a Christ-informed culture. It's not a biblical worldview of how we, we, we interact. Uh, there, there is you know, so, so much bitterness and anger and strife, malice, hatred, division in this world. And um, what's, what's deeply, deeply upsetting is, uh, is how people sometimes seem to have forgotten how to be happy. If you sit down and you, you get someone actually opening up about this, they may even say that. I don't know. It's actually, there's a guy in Scripture says that. I don't know what happiness is. Is life hard? Yeah. In fact, this psalm talks a bit about that. But... It is not so hard as to overwhelm the Christ-abiding person out of their joy. Where you, joy, I, I want you to, to, to think about joy as potentially a, a, the highest of emotions in its transformative power. Where it is present, it changes everything. Have you, have you noticed how a joyful person, when they enter the room, they light it up? The atmosphere changes. Everything's different. You know, this person is radiating joy. But have you noticed when joy is absent, there's a heaviness. And it's not a holy heaviness. There's misery. There's a dark cloud or a, a, an, an, an icy wind blowing. And it's where is the joy? Joy lights up a room. Its absence makes us heavy. But where it exists, you can be certain there is also love. For love and being loved produces joy. So if you are loving your brothers and sisters and you're loving God and you know you are loved by God and you're loved by your brothers and sisters, that produces joy. If you know as you abide in Christ, you are loved by Him. He gave His life for you. That gives you joy. And where there is joy, there is also peace. Which is the one we'll look at next. For how can those immersed in joy be embittered and embattled perpetually? If you're, if you're stewing in bitterness, and if you're always in a battle, even with the people that are your friends and the ones that, or, or the ones that would be your friends or could be your friends, then you are depriving yourself of peace. And you're, you must not be a really happy guy. So we, we have to deeply look in and examine ourselves. Are we abiding in Christ? And we know that as we look at the fruit or the absence thereof. Christian joy, the fruit of the Spirit, of course, has greater depths than that definition I gave you a moment ago, but it is not less than that. 
So if I were to go to the text we just read and create a definition, I would say that our joy is this. Definition of joy from the text. The feeling of complete security and overwhelming satisfaction that produces celebration. The feeling of complete security and overwhelming satisfaction that produces celebration. With that said, let me offer you a first point, the security of joy. Where are you resting, friends? Ask yourself that. Where are you resting? Because where you are resting is where you get your joy. That's where you find security. That's where you have run to get refuge. Look at verse 1. The psalmist is David. It's identified as a miktam of David. You might have a footnote in your, um, uh, in your Bible that says that's a musical or liturgical term. It's a word that's used only a handful of times at the beginning of the Psalms. And even um, Jewish rabbis don't know what it means. There's a lot of speculation about it. But the, 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 um, the current favorite that people have is that it is a psalm that is so treasured, so often repeated, that it is engraved, it's written. Um, and, and, and so it was one that, that is war, it's so often said and so often sung that it's worn into the grooves of the mind. And it's one that is so precious and special that it's engraved in precious metal. Some even have suggested that it is, uh, it is worn, that they would have engraved it in um, uh, a, a royal crown or headdress uh, to remind the King David of the truths herein. Something to note that uh, would in indicate how it is presently used uh, and how it has for millennia been used by the Jewish people. It is recited or sung at funerals. And yet it's about joy. Is that not interesting? That even in the house of mourning, we can talk about joy. Why? Because... Where you are resting gives you joy or doesn't. If you're resting in the wrong place, there's a problem. If, if you're resting in a place where there is no security, there's an issue. But the security of joy that, that David finds is in the Lord. So he says, preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. He says to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. And do you see in um, verse 2, maybe in your Bibles, Lord, the first Lord is capitalized. Do you see that? L-O-R-D. Yeah? Do you see that? Why is it capitalized? I've told you before. It's the personal name of God in Hebrew. Yahweh. Yeah? So, this is the name by which God revealed Himself covenantally to His people in relationship. Do you see the second Lord in English? It's not capitalized. So it's Lord, Yahweh, the God who's revealed Himself powerfully and personally and covenantally, relationally to us, Your redeemed people. You are my Adonai. That is to say, sovereign God, Creator of the heavens and the earth. Lord, you who I know, you who I can talk to, you who has related to me and so I can relate to you, you are my God. You're the one I worship. You're the one I serve. You're the one I run to when I need preservation. I have, he says, no good apart from you. What are you finding your security in? Where are you resting? If you're resting in your righteousness you won't have joy. Why? Because you will fall short of the glory of God. You won't even meet up to your own standards of righteousness. H have you seen that in your life? Like you have a standard that you hold other people to, but you don't even measure up to that. Never mind God's standards. When you are, are trying to do that, 
you can respond with two courses. Self-righteousness, because it's unrighteous people who are self-righteous. You find your righteousness in yourself and maybe, maybe there's this sense of, oh, you know, um, this is what I do and this is how many things I, 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 I've done this week to, to God's glory and I go to church and I sing the songs and I pray the prayers and I read the Bible and I, all, all good things. Self-righteous people often can list off a number of good things. But when it comes down to that crucial question of how are you right with God? How are you saved? None of those are good enough. You will never be good enough in your flesh, in yourself. But God is our good. And this is before Jesus even, that David's saying this. How much more so can we go before the throne of grace and say to the Lord who was incarnate in Jesus Christ, You are my Lord, I have no good apart from You. I'm not righteous in myself. You could also go into self-loathing and that's where you're always talking about you know, just how, how rubbish you are and how bad everything is with you and how you do things and how you think and tear yourself to pieces. But that also dishonors the text because he says, I have no good. When he says, I have no good apart from you, he is saying, I have enough good in you. You are my good. You are my righteousness. You are the one I delight in. You are my joy. You are the one I go to for refuge. And and this is not just something individualistic. See, one thing that that also doesn't contribute to joy is when you're, you're over here on your own, trying to do all of this on your own. You're not sharing it with anybody. I'm not sure uh, uh, about you, uh, but I, I don't enjoy doing stuff on my own. Am I an introverted person? Somewhat. I am, actually, truth be told. But there's some, there are certain activities that I just I don't get anything from them on my own. I don't like having a meal on my own. I need someone to enjoy it with. I don't like watching a film on my own. Who am I going to laugh at stuff with? Who am I going to, you know, make critical comments about the, 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 what's going on there? You know, who can I share the experience with? Who can I get pumped up about something with? There are things I don't like doing on my own. One thing that we should cultivate is the discipline of private and personal prayer and worship and communion with God. But there can be such an emphasis on these things that people, they, they revolve around that entirely. And they miss out on the congregation. I, I know there are people who, who will say, well, I, 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 I don't come to prayer meeting because I pray on my own. That, that's disgraceful. I'm sorry, it is. There, there are 24 hours in a day. Seven days in a week. There's plenty of time for you to pray on your own. But as a congregation, in keeping with millennia of the practice of God's people, we get together. And we get together because it's in that sharing, in that bearing of burdens, and in that, that, that blessing of one another as we pray that we both stand with each other, weeping with those who weep. And what? Rejoicing with those who rejoice. we got to have each other. The Scriptures say, Proverbs says, um, that the one who isolates himself is not wise. He breaks out against all sound judgment. Where are you resting, friends? Where have you found your security? Well, this guy has found his security in the Lord, but... He looks around and he sees there's others who found their security in the Lord and they are worth hanging out with. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. So he's not only rejoicing in the Lord, he's rejoicing in the people of God. Are you following me? Can can we rejoice in each other? Can we take joy in each other? He certainly believes so. In fact, he goes further than just just saying, you know, 
he's finding joy in them. They, in them, in the saints, in the excellent ones, is all his delight. So our joy as we experience God and our rest in Him is attached to the joy we experience congregationally with each other. You know, of course, there are times where we mourn. Yes, there are times when we grieve. There are seasons where we may do more of that than rejoicing with those who rejoice. It's just life. It's accurate. But as we mourn together, I don't know if you've noticed, but sometimes there, that we will be in a setting where there will be tears shed. And then afterwards, we'll be in, engaging people in light conversation, and it's not a problem. Happy conversation. We'll leave. We've, we've had church meetings where there's a heaviness and the stuff is heavy. And I've been praying, God, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. But we walk out of the doors and there's a sense of lightness. Why? That's joy, friends. Because joy is not about on your circumstances. It's about, it's about your Savior. Where are you resting? Have I made that point clear enough? Um, you know... Charles Spurgeon wrote, people who are very happy, especially those who are very happy in the Lord, are not apt to give offense or to take offense. Their minds are so sweetly occupied with higher things that they are not easily distracted by the little troubles which naturally arise among such imperfect creatures as we are. Joy in the Lord is the cure for all discord. Joy in the Lord is one of the best preparations for the trials of life. The cure for care is joy in the Lord. No, my brother, he says, you will not be able to keep on with your fretfulness. No, my sister, you will not be able to weary yourself any longer with your anxieties if the Lord will but fill you with His joy. Do we believe that? Having joy is transformative. You can face anything when you're abiding in Christ because joy is first of all about security, where you are resting. But let's... Look at one other thing. We've seen the security of joy. I want you to also see the satisfaction of joy. What are you chasing? That's my second question for you. What is it that you're chasing? Perhaps if you're miserable, you're chasing the wrong things. Perhaps if you're sad perpetually, and there's times to be sad, don't get me wrong. If you're sad ongoingly, maybe there's, there's something that you're... You're looking for and you're not finding it because you're looking in the wrong place. Or maybe looking for the wrong thing. What are you running after? What are you pursuing in your life that's letting you down? And then let me ask you this. Does God let you down? Does Jesus let you down? Does the Holy Spirit let you down. And if your mind rushes to various things where you have felt let down by other things, ask very carefully, was that God? Or was that something else? So sometimes we can respond to that question, oh no, God doesn't let me down, but His people sure do. And we find ourselves adopting a posture that's very different from that of the psalm talking about imperfect people, but nonetheless, the saints. I delight in them. They're my brothers and my sisters. And we found our refuge in the Lord because we're all running and we're all hurting, but we found a place to rest and a place of safety in Him. I hope that's making sense. Because he says in verse 4, the sorrows of those who run after another God will multiply. So if you're running after the wrong things, you will be sorrowful. We have sorrows in this life, absolutely. 
but multiplied sorrow upon sorrow when you're chasing something else. Maybe you're looking for security. Maybe it's not security you're looking for. You have that. Maybe it's just satisfaction. Sometimes it's money. And so we grasp. And it fails us. Sometimes it's... um, Any number of things that we can think about. My mind is overloading with the various things that people seek. But the the three big ones that they talk about in our society. Money, sex, power. That's it. And you'll actually hear people when you ask them, what is it about? Money, sex, power. This dream of getting rich, being rich, and it's sold by false churches to people to build their audience. And never mind churches that are abusing the gospel, but there are plenty of other false gospels that are being sold out there by people who reject God entirely. There's no scriptural framework. I've told you before of the the young man in the gang um, locally who uh, I I spoke with on one occasion, multiple occasions, but on this particular occasion um, followed a stint where he had told me he had left and he was no longer dealing drugs and he was no longer running with that same crowd. I saw him again and I asked him what, uh, what the red line was. He's back at it. Why? The lure of wealth was so much for him. It was too much for him. That's what he was chasing. When does it stop? When I get rich. And he fell short of 50 cents, die trying. He said, when I get rich or go to prison. He was off the streets for a long time. I didn't see him. I thought, well, maybe he wised up again. I saw him. Where have you been? Prison. And he was back at it. Lesson unlearned. Why? Grasping for what he didn't have. Seeking satisfaction where he didn't have it. Seeking pleasure in all the wrong places. And only imperiling his life and the lives of others around him. You, you, there's, a, there's a spectrum in this society where you can have that and you, we, we can even think about it in terms of that being at the, the, the bottom level of it. But however high you climb, people seeking, people grasping, they're looking for stuff. And they're embarrassing themselves and they're making fools of themselves and they're abusing others. And there's no joy. But this man says, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. That is to say that I have chosen God and He has chosen me. That, that I have a house, I have a home, I have a, um, uh, an eternity with Him. And He has made me His own. I, I belong to God and God, God is mine. He's my God. And I'm not going to chase the gods of this world. Are you? Because chasing those things lets you down. Every idol falls. It it, it corrodes. It rusts. It rots. It dies. It lets you down. God doesn't. The Lord who's revealed Himself to us powerfully, personally, and covenantally, relationally, who reigns over all, He won't let you down. Do you believe that? Because it will change the way you approach life. And it will give you joy. Because they can take other things from you. Health. Wealth. Material, personal prosperity. Your individual well-being as far as humans grade it. But you will still have the Lord. And you have said, I found in Him all my good. That will help you stand. And not only will it help you stand, it will help you celebrate. John Calvin um, is one of the most influential men in Christian history. He's part of the second generation of the Protestant Reformation. 
that band of people across continental Europe who pushed back against the false teaching and excesses of the Roman Catholic Church. He said, there is nothing in afflictions which ought to disturb our joy. And sometimes I say things like that and the response that I get is, oh, you must have an easy life. You must have a very sheltered existence. You must not have seen much pain or suffering. And John Calvin said, nothing in afflictions, there's nothing in afflictions which ought to disturb our joy. Someone might say, well, you've not had my afflictions. He was a refugee from his home nation in his 20s. He never returned to his home because he had come to Protestant beliefs and was not welcome there. They would have killed him. It's not that he really liked the place where he settled that much. In fact, scholars believe that he didn't really like Geneva. But that's where he was. It, it, he was there because he couldn't go home. And where he landed, he received an assignment from God to pastor two churches. One in Strasbourg and one in Geneva. He was a pastor for almost 30 years. He had... Listen to this. You say, so being a refugee is, is enough. Running from your country in fear for your life is quite enough. But Calvin had multiple childhood weaknesses that he wasn't able to overcome. He never recovered from a strict monastic regime from his pre-conversion days. A regime in which he would go to bed very late and wake up very early, often operating on extremely little sleep. His eyes were destroyed by reading with candlelight. He was married. He and his wife had one miscarriage and they were unable to have children thereafter. His wife died less than nine years after they married. And he never remarried. His critics mocked his wife's death. Imagine that. The one that you, you loved and loved and still love so much that oh, she's gone, you're not, you're not looking for anyone else. And, and they mock her death saying she died of boredom. They then mocked him personally. They named their dogs after him, which at the time was one of the worst things you could do. Physically, he suffered with chronic asthma, migraine headaches that kept him up at night when he tried to get what sleep he could. Pleurisy, kidney stones, hemorrhoids, gallstones, severe arthritis, and frequent influenza accompanied with raging fever. Most influential, one of the most influential men of Christian history, certainly the most influential man of his day. A broken and flawed man beset by weaknesses within and without, he served the Lord. Why? because of what he was chasing. This is what he said, no one will calmly and quietly bear, submit to bear the cross except those who have learned to seek their happiness beyond this world. He would say, we can experience joy in adverse circumstances by holding God's benefits in such esteem that the recognition of them and meditation upon them shall overcome all sorrow. There's something heavier than my grief. There's something heavier than my loss. There's something heavier than my sickness. And it is the joy of the Lord and His benefits. But there's, there's, there's something else that we, we, we have to lead into in this psalm, and that is the celebration of joy. So we, we've seen the security of joy, and I've asked you, where are you resting? We've seen the satisfaction of joy, and I've asked you, what are you chasing in your life? And we, we now see the celebration of joy, and I have to ask, how are you rejoicing? The text says, verse 9, Therefore, my heart is glad. My whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. My heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. There's uh, one, one Presbyterian author writing for the Banner of Truth magazine writes, 
Biblical joy is an inward exaltation, a peace, a confidence that God will bring good, that His comforting presence is enough. I want to say that there is much good about that definition. But I have to ask this question. Why is it necessarily inward? It's not less than inward. Don't get me wrong. Don't hear what I'm not saying. It is inward. But throughout Scripture, it's also outward. It's an inward reality that's worked out externally. Calvin, uh, who I just spoke about, very highly about, wrote, Joy is a quiet gladness of heart as one contemplates the goodness of God's saving grace in Christ Jesus. And I want to say there's nothing wrong there. And sometimes your joy is, is known and felt as much in a whisper as it is in a shout. But I guess I have to ask the question, why is it necessarily a quiet gladness? It can be. There is such a thing. But the text before us demonstrates something else um, entirely. Scriptural joy is filled with instruments and music. It's filled with clapping and dancing, with shouts and with singing. And so should the lives of those who are filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Even in the prison, beaten black and blue, Paul and Silas sang... Not because they had much of a voice left, but because they had a song. Their song was Christ. Their song was finding their treasure in Him. Everything else was stripped away. And in the prison, they still had Him. Because He said, I'm with you always. I quoted Spurgeon a bit ago. Spurgeon says uh, of some people... He says, they would seem to be total abstainers of joy. They are suspicious of it, lest it should be carnal excitement or visionary hope. They hang their heads like bulrushes and go mourning all the days as if the religion of Christ knew no higher festival than a funeral. And all of its robes were the garments of despair. He continues, brothers and sisters, despondency is not the fruit of the Spirit. Make no mistake, some depression is frequently the fruit of indigestion or of satanic temptation or of unbelief or of some harbored sin. But the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Constantly looking within your own self instead of looking alone to Christ is enough to breed misery in any heart. He says that he's known some people copy others. So they adopt gloomy expressions because, as he says, they are um, guilty of the unwise imitation of some undoubtedly good person who was of a downcast spirit. And they just have assumed that, oh, this person was very holy and they're a good person. I must copy them. And so they're just copying this sadness as well. He says, some of the best of men have had a melancholy turn, but they would have been better men if this had been overcome. Very dry, but um, when I think about the man who was saying those words, he was a preacher, 1800s, Victorian London, the most influential preacher of his time. Uh, Thousands came to to hear him. Their their, their church grew and expanded uh, many times over. At one point, they had to have this massive building project um, in Elephant and Castle, and so he's he's preaching at another building altogether, one he's uh, less familiar with. And uh, they've packed out the place, and there's a gallery, and some, uh, some pranksters started up shouting that there was a fire. Just to stir everyone up. Oh, wouldn't it be funny if we scared everyone? When you do stupid stuff like that, someone gets killed eventually. And on that day, several people lost their life after being trampled underfoot. The building was so vast that Spurgeon didn't didn't hear what was happening, nor did he see what was going on at first. When he heard the news, he fainted. And he went into a prolonged season in a dark room, staring into the embers of a fire, depressed, 
grieving. It was nothing he had anything to do with. He had no control over it, and yet he took that burden upon himself. The sorrow at people being so stupid and sinful as to do what they did, and the sorrow at the loss of life and those bereaved and the countless lives impacted by that grieved him. There is a time for sorrow. There is a time for grief. And all of his life, he suffered with extremely bad health and depression, sorrow. He died in his 50s. But he still knew the fruit of the Spirit is not despondency. It's joy. And he chose to be joyful. This is a funeral psalm. And so much of its message, I believe, can be summed up in that one word. Therefore. Look at that word. Therefore, my heart is glad. There. Just look at there. There is something to run from. There is no good. There is sorrows. There are other gods that let you down. There are blood sacrifices for pagan deities that can't do anything. There are bad places. There is no inheritance. There is foolishness, faithlessness, heartlessness, and ruthlessness, as the Apostle Paul would call it. There are, are things that could and would shake you. There is Sheol, that is the, the grave, the place of the dead. There is corruption. And if you stop and just look at there, you won't have joy. Take away the first letter and you have here. Look over the psalm. In you. Here. In you. Oh God. I take refuge here among the saints, the ones in whom is all my delight. Here, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. Here, the Lord holds my, my lot. And if you think of lots, it's not, there's not a, a contemporary um, parallel entirely, but think about flipping a coin or dice. And you, 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 if you want, if you want uh, uh, someone rolling dice with your life, you want the one who can guide the, the outcome of where they land. He holds my lot. Here are pleasant places. Here, a beautiful inheritance. Here, wise counsel that even instructs me in the night when it's dark and there's nothing else to speak to me. Here, the Lord is before me, He says. The Lord is beside me at my right hand. Here I will not be shaken. So I'm not only unshaken, but I'm unshakable because God is with me. Here in your presence, at your right hand, verse 11, you make known the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. We have to move from there to here. And then we're able to move forward. And as we, we move forward, we get to therefore. There, here, therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. Do those words seem like you've read them somewhere else before? The Apostle Peter takes them and talks about Jesus. This very psalm. You will not let your Holy One see corruption. He points people living in exile. People who are suffering. People who are distressed. People who are scattered. To the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's what he's pointing you to today. The risen Savior. You can be glad. You can be happy. You can have joy because of Jesus. All that He is. All that He's done. He's been to the grave and back. And He lives forever. So we can rejoice. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask for Your mercy.
We pray that you would help us to be glad. May we lift our voices. May we lift our hearts. May we lift our alls and sing for the joy and the gladness of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.